Good evening, I'm Addie Spanbach and I'm the adult services librarian here at the Concord Library. On behalf of Contra Costa County Library, we wanna welcome you to tonight's forum. Um, we have worked closely with the League of Women Voters, the County Elections Department, and CCTV to bring this program to our community. Tonight's program will stream live on Facebook. It will be available at a later date on the Library and County Elections Department's websites, as well as the League's Voters Edge website. Tonight, our moderator is Ann Flynn from the League of Women Voters. Ann is the immediate past president of the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley. She is a former elected member of the Walnut Creek School Board and retired from the U.S. Department of State as a Foreign Service Officer. Please join me in welcoming Anne. Thank you, Addie. Uh, tonight's forums are co-sponsored with the Contra Costa County Libraries, the Contra Costa Elections Department, and Contra Costa Television. Our timers are Lietta Wood, and Kenneth Coates, and they have cards. If you hold one up, um, when you have 15 seconds left in your time, uh, the yellow card will go up, and when you are finished, the red card will go up. But please finish the sentence you're on. Um, we'll make a transition. But if you keep talking, I'll remind you. <laughs> uh, the, the forum uh, this evening is the Concord City Council District 3. Earlier, the candidates drew lots for speaking order. Now I'd like to introduce tonight's candidates. Our first speaker will be Dominic Aliano, and then Kenji Yamada. The format is each candidate will have a one minute opening statement, then we'll proceed to question and answer segment of the program where I'll ask questions written by the audience. Each candidate will have one minute to answer each question. Personal attacks are not permitted. Statements made about other candidates must be in the public record or are not allowed. As moderator, I will interrupt if the answer is taking additional time. Questions will be submitted by the audience on three by five cards and will be picked up by our volunteers. So keep writing cards during the uh, program as things occur to you. Now we'll proceed with the opening statements beginning with Dominic Aliano. Thank you, Anne. I first, I would like to thank the Contra Costa County uh, Libraries, Contra Costa County Elections Division, the League of Women Voters, and CCTV for hosting tonight's forum. Uh, I've grown up in Concord. I share your values, the values that were taught to me by my parents, hard work, integrity, and lending a helping hand to others in need. These principles continue to guide me today. You know, I'm running for city council to expand on my public service to Concord. My top priorities are to invest in economic development, creating jobs, improving our public safety within our neighborhoods, and expanding our uh, city services and pothole repair, and expanding efforts to keep housing affordable. I am proud to be supported by police, fire, business, uh, businesses within the community, uh, working men and women, and local elected officials, and I'd be honored to have your support and vote. Thank you. Thank you, and now Kenji Yamada. Thank you. Um, I'm running with a purpose, and that is to help bring more priority and focus to certain needs that have been underserved and underrepresented in this city so far. Those are particularly the needs of vulnerable residents, and especially in the monument community, most of which lies in District 3, which uh, my opponent and I are running to represent. Uh, those are needs regarding um, spiking rents, unfair evictions, and homelessness. I am running to deal with those problems and to champion certain very crucial solutions to them, which we've had a hard time getting so far. That is my purpose. Um, I'm invested in the monument community. It is where the part of the city that I most like to be in is where I live and is where I particularly want to represent. Um, and I'm. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, you yeah, go ahead. All right. Okay, we'll catch up uh, later with questions. The first question is about rent control. Uh, do you support rent control? And uh, if so, what form should it take? Uh, and that also, uh, because we're the League of Women Voters, we're interested in Proposition 10, which is on the ballot. What's your position on Prop 10? So we'll start with Kenji, please. I do support both rent control and just cause eviction protections. It is crucial that the two of them go together because the absence of either allows each of them to be circumvented. They reinforce one another. I also strongly support Proposition 10, which would repeal Costa Hawkins, a 1995 state law which carves out large sections of our housing stock from rent control, takes the decision out of the hands of local government. 
we need that authority back to make our own decisions based on our local circumstances. Thank you, and Dominic? I also do support rent control and just cause eviction. Uh, you know, I, I do believe that Kenji and I, whoever is elected, is gonna have to work very diligently to work on passing a rent control ordinance with the other council members. And so we will work on what that looks like later on in the future. Uh, when it comes to Prop 10, I also support Prop 10. I think Prop 10 is frozen in time and doesn't address uh, the current situation. And I believe in local control because the city council has the best, um, best feel on how the community works instead of the state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dominic, uh, you'll get the next question first. Um, do you have a concrete solution for how to support the homeless in District 3? I think to address the homeless situation in, in District 3 is we need to really build a coalition with the nonprofits within Contra Costa County. We need to build a coalition with county services. And the city of Concord needs to do more of its part in working with those organizations to provide the services that we need to provide. There are a lot of organizations out there, but the, the situation is um, when someone wants to use those services, they have a hard time figuring out where those services are. And a lot of times, education is the is the biggest struggle to let people know what services are available, where to go, how, what the system is in order to get what you need. And so I think we need to work on building that coalition, building on those relationships, and creating a system that is easy for homeless individuals to get services. Thank you. Kenji? So, you know, there's a lot of county, there's agencies, there's the county, and there are, are nonprofits working on homelessness and providing a variety of kinds of services. But the problem is not just education of homeless people about what services there are. Some of those services are deficient in specific ways. And to understand what, in what ways those services are def deficient is important for the representative of residents, including homeless residents, to sit down with homeless residents and talk and listen. You develop a lot of personal relationships with individual homeless residents in District 3. I have been doing a great deal of that. And I have learned some things that you don't learn by sitting down and just talking with staff of organizations and county agencies. For example, the, the shelter on Arnold Industrial Way doesn't allow dogs. Um, spouses can't stay together. There's nowhere for people to store their possessions. Theft is a major concern constantly for a person who is homeless. You can't take for granted that you have a safe place to keep your possessions. You can't abandon your dog while you're taking shelter. These are basic things that, that are, should be obvious if you have been in that situation, and they become obvious to you after you listen a good deal to people who are in that situation. That is a duty for anyone who means to address this problem and to represent our homeless residents. Thank you. So Kenji, we'll start uh, with you on this question. Uh, there are many efforts uh, concentrated on reviving the downtown um, as a desirable destination, uh, but the monument revitalization is slow. What would you recommend to get monument on a positive track? Some of it is publicity. There's a, the monument already has a lot to offer. It's, in my opinion, it's the best part of Concord, and I say that without favoritism. It has a lot to offer in terms of diversity, of cuisines, of cultures, of community activities in our parks and our schools, it's a great part of Concord, but that needs to be better known. But to some extent, uh, helping businesses to flower in the monument involves um, our residents having more disposable income. And that comes back again to rents and the insecurity of people's financial situations and their home situations. Until we al allow people to have that breathing room economically, they will not be able to contribute as much to our economy and keep it moving as much as they could have. So everything comes back again to the basic economics of people's ability to be secure in their livelihoods and their homes. That's top of issue, and it may not always be apparent how it reaches into every other issue, but it does. Thank you. Dominic? The monument is a beautiful area of Concord, and a lot of the residents from that community are proud of what the monument is already, but there's always room uh, for improvement when it comes to businesses. I think what it, we need to be careful about is when we bring businesses into the monument community, we can, got to make sure that they're not going to neg negatively affect the local homegrown businesses that have been there for years, that have been there for decades. Because uh, the people that are operating on those businesses are, are single mom and pop stores, single families. They're not corporations that are coming in and um, that have financial backing to deal with shifts in the economy. So when we bring businesses in, we got to make sure that they're going to be able to vibe with the current culture and the current marketplace that is within the monument area. Thank you. And um, Kenji, you already did this one. Did I just lose you? 
<laughs> it happened. Um, what would you do to increase job opportunities for your constituents, Dominic? You know, I think that is a greater question for the greater city of Concord, because when my dist district succeeds, not only do we need all districts to succeed in order to bring jobs to the city of Concord, and that is dealing with quality of life. Uh, that regards the planning, transportation, marketing the city for people to come to the city of Concord. Um, businesses that see this will want to invest in the city of Concord. Uh, seeing that city services are there and that people are happy, when we are able to do that and build a better quality of life, then those businesses will be able will want to invest within our community and create jobs for the people within District 3 in all of Concord. Thank you. Kenji? And again, my answer to this comes down to bringing up the bottom of our economic ladder is better for everybody and boosts our economy. This is, I think, in the monument, just as, as a microcosm of the larger economic picture, what eco economists call boosting aggregate demand, which is a fancy word for saying um, increasing the money in the pockets of people who have least. That's what grows economies. That's what, what builds small local businesses. That's what creates jobs. It's not just by giving advantages to, to businesses or by reducing obstacles. We do need to reduce irrational obstacles to business. There are some, and, and we need to make sure that every burden we put on business has a rational purpose and doesn't exceed that. But fundamentally, the, the, better, the better all of our residents do, especially those who have least, the better everyone will do. That's a fundamental. It's, it works on a large scale, and it works on a local scale. Thank you. Uh, Kenji, uh, there is blight uh, of either non-used or partially used strip malls and other properties in Concord. Um, there are huge unused parking lots that could have uh, be brought into uh, use. Uh, do you have a solution for blight? Well, blight means a lot of different things to different people. There are a lot of specific things that people bring under that name. For example, appliances left on driveways or um, vacant retail space broken windows, um, litter. These are, these are all things that have different causes and different consequences that all get grouped together under this title of blight, and it's not always appropriate to deal with all of them in exactly the same way. Regarding retail vacancies, there isn't that high of a retail vacancy rate in the monument community. Um, there is a lot of unused space in some of the centers. I'll take an example of um, a resident brought the idea to me of the, the back parking lot area of 15, the 1500 Monument Center an idea of maybe trying to find a way that um, people who have work trucks on the residential streets, there's a lot of people who have trucks they use for, for practical work, um, could maybe pay to park their, their trucks there at some reasonable rate, use that unused space, and reduce parking pressures on the, the residential streets. That's an idea of you know, a small practical idea that could relieve some pressures and put to use some resources currently going to waste. But um, light encompasses a lot of things, and there are a lot of different pieces of solutions. It's not just one idea. Thank you. Dominic? Yeah. I District 3, the monument community, I don't think it's blighted. I mean, there's obviously certain retail areas that have vacancies and need to be upgraded, uh, you know, because there are certain retail centers that were constructed in the 70s, the 80s. And when it comes to making sure that the people that own those retail centers bring those businesses in or update those uh, centers, we need to have a little bit of the carrot and the stick. And the city of Concord has been working on that with the retail revitalization program. But again, it goes back to the question you asked earlier and the response that I gave you. We need to be careful on how we proceed with that program because we don't want to neg negatively affect the current businesses that live within those retail areas or uh, operate within those retail areas because a lot of those businesses are thriving within that community. And what we want to do is bring businesses in that would, again, vibe with those uh, businesses and continue to grow the great community that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hey, Dominic. Uh, what kind of policies, if any, would you pursue to promote social and racial justice in your area? Well, I believe rent control is one of those policies. I believe just cause is one of those policies. I believe the city of Concord did a great job in improving uh, the inclusive ordinance, bringing that. Uh, what I would like to do is to help with a lot of the um, families within the monument community is, I would like to create a position within the police department that would be basically a community liaison person to build the relationships up, to let them know that it's okay to contact the police department, that we are not gonna um, work with ICE and, and negatively affect our um, immigrant community. And so we want, we want them to be, feel comfortable. We want them to feel safe. 
And the best way to do that is by building a stronger relationship with the community and the police department. And I believe if we had one individual within the police department that, would, that did that, it would make a stronger community. Thank you. Kenji? No, I, I agree that rent control and just cause protections are a major part of it because they help prevent displacement, which, which alienates different parts of a community from one another. Um, but on another note, you know, I think it would be a great advantage for our residents, especially those who are Spanish primary or Spanish speaking only, to be able to talk directly to their council member. I do have the advantage of speaking Spanish and getting fairly fluent lately canvassing doors of Spanish speaking residents. Um, and you know, residents will be able to come to me and we don't need an interpreter. They can tell me what's going on. I can keep them abreast of what's going on in the city, what policies are. They can tell me about the realities they're experiencing. We can work out any gaps between those two. Um, it's, it's a major advantage for someone to be able to talk directly to their council member without needing a translation. Thank you. Now switching gears, uh, Kenji, some people in our community say that we have traffic problems. Uh, what do you think about that? And is there uh, a problem, and what would you do to mitigate these concerns or to change the situation? We do have a lot of traffic problems. A lot of them have to do, I mean, they're mostly at the commute times, commutes to work or commutes to school. That, those are the traffic peaks, of course. Um, and a, in my opinion, there is no way out of traffic problems by just expanding the resources we spend on cars, expanding roads, spending more money on parking. Um, infrastructure for driving is hugely expensive, expanding it still more so. So we have to expand um, practical, safe alternatives to driving. And a major way of doing that that I have in mind is a protected school bikeway. That's a major project. But um, protected bicycle infrastructure has been shown to work in places where it's been tried, which is not many places in the United States. But by protection, I mean things like physical separation between cars and bicyclists to a standard that meets the needs of seniors and young people. But to show the practicality of that, I think it's important that our leaders be the example and themselves do what they are saying others should be able to do or are trying to make others do. I do personally bicycle myself and avoid driving, and I would like to make that a safer, more practical option for others. Dominic? Thank you for asking that question. That is a great question because traffic and transportation is a huge issue within this community. I commute through this county on my day job. Um, through morning and night, and you know the Concord Naval Weapons Station needs to be planned carefully, or else it's not only going to affect Concord residents; it's, it's a regional issue. It's going to affect Pittsburgh, Martinez, and Pleasant Hill residents. And so, in order for us to help the situation when it comes to transportation, we need to build by giving uh, residents the opportunity of using other modes of transportation, whether that it become from, like Kenji said, bike, uh, transit, bus and not let them rely on using their vehicle all the time. So when it comes to the Concord Naval Weapons Station, we need to build by um, giving people the access to those modes of transportation and putting you know, stores in close proximity so they don't have to re rely on those vehicles and their jobs, bringing in jobs to the, to the Naval Weapons Station so they don't have to commute far. And again, it's quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are really interested in bicycles in the audience. Um, so do you have specific streets or intersections that you would improve to ensure the safety of bicycle and pedestrians? Uh, Dominic? Yes. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is uh, Concord Boulevard. And, you know, one of the... One of the difficult situations with that is our predecessors, when they were building the city, they really didn't think about bikes. I mean, the suburban community, they only thought about vehicles. And back then, planning was thought of differently. So now, uh, when it comes to Concord Avenue, it's difficult in order to put a lot of those bike lanes in because a lot of those um, vehicles park within that area. So when we when we make certain, when people come in, they want to make certain changes to their property, we do everything in our everything in our power that we can do in order to uh, let those people park on their property or somehow incentivize them to park within different lots within that area. Because there was a project that did come through that was on Concord Avenue uh, that came through the Planning Commission. And we were able to work with the applicant in order to create one more parking space on the lot so that they could park on the property instead of on the street. Thank you. Thank you. Kenji? I think Concord Boulevard's a good candidate. I think a better one would be Oak Grove Road. Um, I, that used to be a major commute route for me, and I would see the traffic every morning, parent, child, parent, child, parent, child, car after car. That's most of what was producing that traffic and what still is. Um, 
And I think sometimes, unfortunately, you know, I've, I've been back and forth with the transportation engineers for about four years. I used to lead bicycle advocacy for Bike Concord for about three years. And again and again, we run into the problem of the problem being treated as an obstacle to the solution. The problem being the need, the very legitimate and understandable need of parents to drive their kids to school because of the danger of other parents driving their kids to school. You see the cycle there. We need to break out of that cycle. And to me, the way to break out of that cycle is a protected bikeway, meaning a bikeway that is actually physically separated so that cars cannot get into the space where kids on bikes are. It has been tried in other parts of the world. It works very well. On Oak Grove Road, it is how we break out of that cycle and cut down on that traffic. And it could serve many schools running that route, St. Francis of Assisi, uh, YV Elementary, spur over um, to, on Detroit Avenue, it could get up to Meadow Homes, De La Salle maybe, if you could, et cetera. Thank you very much. Um, interest of full disclosure, <clears throat> that's one of the league's uh, primary uh, reasons for uh, doing voter education. Where does the funding for your campaign come from, Kenji? I am proud to say that the funding from my campaign comes solely from individual contributions of not more than $200. I set that limit intentionally because um, equity is important to me, uh, and it is important in politics as well as other places. And I believe that where a candidate's money comes from will affect their motivations, regardless of whether they intentionally want it to or, or consciously believe it does. And so I have narrowed the gap between what someone can afford, maybe 5 or $10, and the max I will take of 200 so as to make sure I am accountable to all residents, not just those who have most. I think that is a commitment that a candidate should stand to if they are serious about equity. Thank you. Dominic. Uh, most of my funding comes from the construction and building trades. Uh, I grew up in a construction family, so a lot of, have a lot of their support. And a lot of the businesses uh, in, the, in the Monument Area, District 3, a lot of the restaurants and taquerias and uh, supermarkets are um, supporting me. Thank you. Um, is Concord prepared for a disaster, Dominic? What type of disaster? <laughs> well, we've, what do we think? Uh, fires, earthquakes, floods? Um, earthquake is probably the- Do I get more than a minute? <laughs> <laughs> How's I, I, Yes, they are. You know, uh, we have, our public safety is well-maintained and well-trained. Uh, Contra Costa County has a fantastic fire department. Uh, that is ready for all kinds of fires and coordinates very well with our police department every time there's a, a situation. Uh, the police department has a great relationship with our community and is very responsive. Um, you know, we have our own um, uh, call center, so it allows us the ability to respond to calls faster and control what's going on within our city. Um, I believe we're ready, and, you know, we have... Uh, community impact teams, we have volunteers that uh, are disaster prepared readiness, and so uh, I believe we're ready for a disaster, and you know, if you like to, I like to get in details about certain disasters, but in general, yeah, we are. Thank you. Kenji? Generally, I would agree. I, you know, responses to situations such as the fire, the arson of the, the apartment building on um, Concord Boulevard a little bit ago by Sutter Street. Um, it shows that our, our emergency personnel are very well-trained, well-equipped, and professional and serious about what they do. Um, the county's fire protection district does a great job. Um, and as, as was mentioned in the um, District 1 form a little earlier, the city does maintain already about a 30% budgetary reserve, which on a budget of $100 million is about $30 million. Um, so it seems to me we're in pretty good shape for that. Thank you. Uh, Kenji, if you could change one thing in Concord zoning codes, what would it be? I would try to reduce the distances between homes and businesses by any means possible. That distance generates traffic congestion. There's a lot of ways to do it, but that's the general rubric. Thank you. Dominic? I would work on creating higher densities. You know, we're in a housing crisis, and a lot of our city's already built out, but there's a lot of properties that we could um, zone for higher densities because we need to build more housing within our community. and that's something I would like to see. Thank you. Okay, um, the Naval Weapon Station is years off. Uh, what concrete plans do you have for making an impact in our underserved communities today, especially uh, concerning access to uh, schools and I would add jobs? Dominic? Well, I first, the first thing that I think to serve, uh, I think the first thing we need to do is to make sure that 
we, we spread the affordability throughout the whole Naval Weapons Station. I believe that it's not equitable if we put all the affordable housing into one location, and I be firmly believe that the United States failed when they did that with HUD. Um, that it's not equitable, it needs to be spread out, and throughout the base, again, giving those communities equal opportunity to use other modes of transportation than vehicles, and making sure that we zone certain areas within the Conquer Naval Weapons Station that allows those people that live within certain communities to easily walk, bike, or get to those areas instead of having to live on the other side of the Naval Weapons Station, get in your car, and travel all the way down to the other end or into the current part of town to get groceries. Thank you. Kenji. I agree with those points. And in addition, I would like to push a little harder for higher than the 25% affordability, uh, affordable unit um, minimum that the project already has. That, that number means that um, residential projects are required to have at least 25% of the units they construct affordable under HUD guidelines. And that means that they must cost no more than 30% of 80% of area median income. That's the top line for what HUD considers affordable. Um, we can push a little harder for a higher percentage than that, and we can also push for deeper affordability, meaning to lower levels of income under HUD guidelines. That's not easy to do. You, when, as soon as you raise anything like that to developers, you'll immediately hear the phrase, pencil out. It won't pencil out. And what that means is they expect that if that is done, the profits will not be high enough to satisfy them. So it's a, you know, it's a little bit of a game of chicken sometimes where each side is saying, you push for this and I'll walk away. So um, we need, it, it takes some nerve to push on that and also takes um, a willingness to listen to experts in a variety of places, including affordable housing experts, to figure out how far can we push and how much can we extract for our people. You know, For-profit development and the interests of our people sometimes are in conflict and we have to fight for our people, not for developers. Thank you very much. Okay, Kenji. Is a soccer stadium in downtown Concord a good idea or a bad idea near the BART station? Honestly, I am not real sure about that one way or the other. My, my gut feeling is we don't need that. I am not real settled on that opinion. I'm pretty open to arguments on it, and I haven't thought real, real carefully or dug very deeply into it. I've thought about it a little, so I'm open to being convinced on that one. Okay. Dominic, are you a soccer player? Actually, I, how'd you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did play soccer. I grew up playing soccer for many of the clubs around here in Concord and uh, wish I was still young enough to <laughs> play. But uh, um, when it comes to the stadium, there's still a lot that we need to figure out in order before we commit to that. And the reason I say that is what's essentially proposed, uh, we need to find out in fine detail what exactly that's going to be because it's gonna affect transportation, quality of life, uh, people, noise. I mean, look what happened in Santa Clara when it came to concerts and um, those venues that happened over there when it came to after hours and noise. Uh, but you know, there's positive and negatives to it. I'm open to it. Uh, would I like to see a soccer stadium? If it fits for our community, I would, because then I would, I would, I'd love to watch the games here, so. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dominic. Uh, Contra Costa seems behind the curve on landfill avoidance by composting green waste and food soiled paper. Uh, neighboring counties of Alameda and San Francisco have cutting edge composting in place. Are we interested in joining our neighbors in this? Oh, for sure. So is that <laughs> going to be a priority? <laughs> I, I, I would like it to be. You know, I, I, after working with the county, the county operates a lot with recycling services, and um, Mount Diablo Recycling is one of the most uh, advanced companies when it comes to recycling within the country. Um, they're, they're figuring out new ways to take food, garbage, and turn it into power. And, you know, that is going to help with the economy when it comes to, um, not, excuse me, not the economy, it's going to help with the environment. And that's very important to me. And I do support compost and, and making sure that we work on that. And I'm sure uh, our service provider would be interested or they probably might, they probably already have something like that. So thank you. Kenji? Strongly in favor of composting. Uh, we, my wife and I do that ourselves in our home. And um, I th you know, the city has some leverage on trying to encourage that in, in our co contract with Concord Disposal. And I'm sure, hope they would be interested in doing it. And I'd very much like to see us get curbside composting and start turning food waste into usable soil. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, Kenji, uh, the City Council will be putting Measure Q on the ballot in 2020. This will be the third time in a decade that it will have been placed on the ballot. Do you believe Measure Q should be a permanent tax or have an end date? And when should that end date be? Should Measure Q be more than the proposed 1%? So I, I have spent, you know, I went to the, the council's budget stabilization workshop, a lot of meetings where the, the projected deficit was discussed, and I have been looking for ways that we could avoid having to increase Measure Q from the current half percent sales tax to a full percent. I haven't found it, apart from defaulting on contractual obligations, which is not a good thing for a city to do. I am convinced we do need to double Measure Q to a full percent. It's not a popular opinion, but I think that's what we've got to do to close what is projected to be a $13.4 million annual deficit by fiscal year 26-27, which coincidentally is about the current annual yield of Measure Q at its current half percent. Um, as for a sunset, I wouldn't want to commit advance to a sunset unless I could see a sunset on our deficit. I don't see one, and so it doesn't make sense to me to say we will cut this off not knowing whether our, our, the, the gap will be filled. I do think that if we see that we no longer need it, we should start phasing it out or eliminate it when that time comes, shrink wrap it down. But a commitment without a good reason for that commitment, I don't support that. Dominic? For everybody that's here and everybody that's watching, you're not going to change our minds on this because we both strongly support Measure Q and uh, it's needed. Like I mentioned earlier, if you want services, you have to pay for services. Uh, we're going to be in a deficit in 26-27. But when it comes to a sunset, I, uh, I would like to have a sunset, but I'm not going to commit to it yet because... Um, you know, who knows where we're going to be in 20. So that's two years from now. Um, but I would like to see a sunset on Measure Q because, you know, when it, first, when it was initially passed, the city of Concord promised that it would sunset, and unfortunately we have not been able to do that and balance our budget when Measure Q sunsets. Okay, now in the wish book, Dominic, um, if you received a $10 million grant to use in any way you wanted in the city, what would you do with it? Oh, man. Um... <laughs> I would say I would like to use some of that ten million dollar grant. I would like to use some of that to pay off our unfunded liabilities and to use some of that to work with our nonprofits to build affordable housing within our community. Thank you, Kenji. This is going to be a surprising answer coming from me, but a lot of it I would spend on road maintenance. I'm not someone who favors spending a lot of money on infrastructure for cars, but the reason why I would favor putting a lot of it into road maintenance is because uh, road damage worsens what they call logarithmically, meaning it doesn't just get worse at a steady rate, it gets worse faster over time. And so money spent today matters a great deal more than money spent later. Let's say it goes farther when spent today than, farther than when spent later. So you know, if you can spend money in a way that, that multiplies its benefit and saves you a much bigger cost down, down the road, um, I think that's a good use of money. Um, affordable housing is important, but getting the most bang for our buck for things that we're going to have to do anyway makes more sense to me. Okay, now that you've got your crystal ball out and polished, uh, what will Concord look like in five to ten years? Kenji? <laughs> My crystal ball. Yeah. In five to ten years, I hope, if we take the, the current housing crisis seriously, I hope we will have a lot of the same residents that we have today, especially those who are renting. They will still be here. If we don't take it seriously, they will have moved away and probably at grace cost themselves and their families. Dominic? I would say uh, that hopefully in five to 10 years from now, we have uh, a very um, well-maintained, developed specific plan for the Concord Naval Weapons Station and that we're moving forward with that. Uh, I hope we're uh, paying down some of our debt when it comes to the budget. I hope that we are continuing to work on our public safety to improve it so people feel comfortable within our community. Uh, because when people feel comfortable within our community, again, it's going to help quality, quality of life, and that's a big thing for me. And when quality of life is good, people stay, businesses come, and, and this community thrives. Thank you. Uh, Dominic, do you support a buffer between existing housing and new development on the Concord Coast Guard housing property? and the Concord Naval Weapons Station property? And is, is there a, a number of feet you think is appropriate? You know, I, I know the city council committed to a certain buffer amongst Dana Estates in that area. Uh, in regards to the, uh, the Coast Guard property, I wouldn't like to see a buffer because 
personally, I think when we add a buffer, then we're creating the two conquers we don't want to create. Um, I mean, am I, am, I, am I saying that house has got to be, fence has got to be straight up back to back and that, you know, you're going to be looking at your neighbor through your window? No, I mean, I, I feel like there can be some yardage in between the new development, but I don't feel like there needs to be a huge buffer that it feels like there's going to be a different, totally different community. One conquered, we need to keep everybody together, not, not separate them. Kenji? You know, I, I agree with that principle. We don't want separations. I think the, some of the concern that's raised when people talk about buffers is particularly when we were hearing from Sun Terrace residents with regard to the Naval Weapons Station and any high density development around North Concord BART is um, abrupt transitions from single family homes, say, to a five story or an eight story apartment building. That's what has concerned a lot of residents. I'm sensitive to that. We, that can be addressed in you know, more gradual transitions. The, the high um, building's a little further away and not immediately up. But it also depends on what's meant by a buffer. Do we mean a fence? Do we mean a green area open to all to enjoy? What is meant by that? Is it a space to invite people in or a barrier to keep people apart? That's crucial. And it, it, the answer to that question determines my friendliness to the idea of a buffer. Thank you. Um, there are no term limits for uh, city council seats. Um, what is your position on term limits? Do you think uh, we should limit uh, the amount of time a, a, a civil, uh, you can, um, run for uh, civic office, Kenji? I'm friendly to the idea of term limits. I don't think they should be very short. I would think two terms is too short to say a person cannot continue even if they retain the support of the people. Um, maybe five terms is a little much to allow someone to, to serve. So I, I guess I'm generally friendly to term limits at, at some remove, but maybe not as short of one as some might favor. And Dominic? I really don't have a position on that because um, the negative thing with term limits is say if we only uh, allow someone to serve two terms for four years a term, what happens is, and I've seen this in other cities, is you lose a lot of institutional, institutional knowledge with those uh, electeds. But at the same time, with someone that, like Kenji said, is serving 20 plus, uh, 30 years, you know, they sometimes tend to get out of touch with the community as demographics change and we move on into the future. So um, at this point, no real position on that, but um, you know, I understand the positives and negatives of term limits. Thank you very much. Now, um, we haven't, this is the last question. We ran out of time. I know more people have submitted questions than we have time for. Perhaps the candidates can stay late um, and you can ask your question in person. Uh, but for the final question, Dominic, um, what are the most important challenges facing Concord today? I think uh, Kenji and I both would agree with this is the affordability for families within District 3. Um, you know, making sure that we pass a ro robust rent control ordinance and just cause eviction uh, to help families that are hurting when it comes to having stress-free environments and feeling safe and comfortable within their community. Um, you know, at the same time, we need to continue to build because when we, the rent control ordinance isn't going to fix the housing issue. We need to continue by building more housing, uh, a make, healthy mix of market rate to affordability, improving the public safety within, uh, within the city. You know, the city of Concord has done a great job, but there's always more that we can do. Uh, again, you know, within the parameters of our budget, approving more cops and building better community relationships with the community. Uh, again, improving our roads. I know there's a lot of roads. Unfortunately, District 3, uh, this might not be the proper term, but it's been forgotten when it comes to roads, and there's a lot of roads in that area that need to be well main, better maintained. Thank you. Kenji? And I would agree. The, the needs of our most vulnerable residents for housing stability, that's, that's the top challenge, and the, the challenge of most urgency for the quality of life of our people. And for that reason, I think it's important that District 3 in particular be represented by someone who has been focused on this issue for some time, who showed up with residents, supported them, made the arguments, done the research, and has concrete specific ideas to start negotiations with the rest of the council on details, and won't be asking them what their ideas are, but starting with the position that we talk about. Thank you. Now, each candidate will have one minute for closing remarks. This is in the reverse uh, of their opening statement, so first is Kenji Yamada. So my, my pitch for myself as one of two candidates here is that I am the person who has been focused on the needs of vulnerable residents as a primary concern for some time now. I will hit the ground running because I have particular ideas from four years of thinking, reading, and building relationships around this set of issues, housing affordability, evictions, the needs of vulnerable residents. 
Um, and when, we, when it comes time to make decisions among five council members, it's very important that the advocate for vulnerable residents be ready to lead, not just to come to council members and say, what are you willing to do, but to take a position, negotiate from that position, and be ready to make arguments on the dais in front of the public and privately with other groups and residents who will come and bring the pressure that moves decisions on city council. I am that candidate. I have been spending that time, and I'm ready to hit the, hit the ground running for vulnerable residents. Thank you. Dominic Aliano. <clears throat> well, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, County, uh, Contra Costa County Library, League of Women Voters, the election, County Elections Division, and CCTV. Um, you know, I'm a, again, I'm a product of Concord. I was born, raised, and educated in Concord. I serve as the chair of the Concord Planning Commission. I serve on the board for the Toto Santos Business Association, Support for Recovery, and I'm a former board member with the Monument Crisis Center. I have experience when it comes to getting things done, working with other electeds, working with community, building coalitions in order to see uh, what we want to achieve, whether that comes to certain regulations or ordinances. And having that experience is needed. And having my experience with zoning and planning, especially when the Concord Naval Weapons Station is coming, you need someone that understands how to proceed on those matters. So thank you very much, and I'd be honored to have your vote. Thank you very much. Now these are your two candidates for Concord City Council District 3. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> for more information about uh, the candidates, um, you can go to our website for the League of Women Voters called votersedge.org. And I want to thank our co-sponsors, the County Libraries, the County Elections Department, and Contra Costa Television, and especially your candidates, who have offered their service, their ideas, and their commitment. Thank you all for attending this candidate forum this evening, and remember to vote on November 6. Good evening.